Remember we read in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 9 has, has some of the, the prophetic uh, utterances about the coming of Messiah. And uh, it's, it starts in verse 2 talking about what was going to happen. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness on them, a light has shone. And it goes on to talk about the breaking of oppression and a yoke that would be lifted and joy that would come and, and, and all, all this, uh, this great just poetic description of what's going to happen. And then, then he starts talking about how. In verse 6, a verse we know well. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is how this is all going to happen. The government will be on his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And then the last bit of this verse says, why? How could this happen? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. I did a some studying on the word zeal. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit and then we're going to apply it to, to our lives today. See, zeal, it comes from, uh, in, in this verse, which is in Hebrew, because it's the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is kinah, and it means, I think I said that halfway correct, and it means it means ardor or zeal or jealousy. Jealousy actually, zeal and zealous, zealous and, and jealous are are coming in English. Kind of come from the same root word, right? They just change the the z to a j at some point, and then the meanings changed a little bit too. Jealousy most of the time means something kind of negative, not all the time. But, but it, in the Hebrew, it comes from, the word uh, uh, kinah comes from the color produced on, on someone's face when they have like a really d strong emotion, you know, like your face gets red or something. That's what that word comes from. In Greek, it's the word zelos. Guess where we get our word zeal from? <laughs> it's from the Greek by way of Latin. Uh, the definition to have a, a warmth of feeling either for or against, depending on the situation, to be zealous or jealous, uh, it, it, it kind of, there's a word called, uh, there's a, a, some words that have, a, that come from the sound of things, like tick-tock, right, comes from the sound of a clock makes, or clippity-clop, right, kind of comes from the, from the sound a horse makes, or, or if you say sizzle, it's kind of a word that sounds like sizzle, right, <laughs> right, so there's, there's words like that, and, and in the Greek, zealous, zelos, comes from it's a sound that kind of mimics the sound of of water bubbling from heat that's boiling right and so it, it, that's that's kind of where this word comes from it because it, it describes a burning emotion an inner, inner feeling of boiling over or of boiling from heat and figuratively it, it, it's something very fervent very like it's red hot right spirits filled zeal to serve the Lord and, and it can be used negatively, like jealousy, and positively, like zeal. So it so kind of depends on, on the application, right? And it literally means, the root of this word literally means hot enough to boil, right? So like we said before, anger, burning anger or love or zeal, uh, and, and it, it can refer to something good or bad. So... That's kind of the, the word broadly speaking. But in, in the Old Testament, the zeal of the Lord, the zeal of Yahweh in particular, is a little bigger than just the Greek word zelos, this word, this word kina in, 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 uh, in Hebrew, a little bigger than that. And uh, when, when it's a reference to, to Yahweh, to the Lord God, it almost always it involves his relationship to his people. 
is people of Israel. Whenever it's talking about the zeal of the Lord, it's almost always talking, in, somewhere in there it has to do with his people, right? His, his zeal gets provoked, for example, when Israel goes and, and worships other gods. They worship idols, right? That, that's, in, that's in the second commandment. It says, don't make an image. Don't bow down to it because your God is a jealous God, right? He says, you're mine. You're not somebody else's. And, and the, the other side of that is, is maybe the nations think they can disrupt God's plan for Israel, but then the zeal of God intervenes and stops the nations. So that's the, kind of like the positive side, all right? So you got this, this maybe not so nice side for Israel if they're being disobedient, but then they also have this protective side where the zeal of the Lord accomplishes something for them, and it doesn't matter what these other nations think they're going to do. The zeal of the Lord comes into play. And, and in the old, the, in the, if you, and this is, this is, the stuff I'm telling you is from just looking at every verse that this occurs and forming a kind of a broad picture, all right? So if you looked at every verse that, that, that this uh, word zeal or zealous or jealous or jealousy is used in relation to God in the Old Testament, this is kind of the picture you would form. The zealousness of God is always closely linked to his holiness and power, which belong to him alone. And it's not regarded in the, in the Old Testament as a passing mood, but it's something that's the very essence of God. In other words, he just doesn't fly into a rage. This is just some temporary thing. This is part of his essence, his zeal, his passion, his fervor is part of who he is. Right? For example, in Deuteronomy, Moses is giving them a warning. They're about to go into the promised land. And all of Deuteronomy is one long farewell speech. The last few things that Moses is going to say to them. And he says, Take care, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, and form anything that the Lord God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And, and the writer of Hebrews picked this up. He was part of a longer conversation that in, in, in Hebrews 12 where he's talking about Mount Sinai and how the Lord appeared with the thunder and the earthquakes and the lightning and the rumbling and, and the, the booming voice. And they were all afraid. And there was an edict to not touch the mountain. To not even touch the mountain. They roped it off. Any man or beast that touched the mountain supposed to be put to death because God's holiness was descending on that mountain and and in the, in the writer of Hebrews is comparing that to that that how the the old covenant came the the mosaic covenant and he's comparing it to how the new covenant comes right and and he says he says that 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 this voice now shakes the heavens and and is going to shake everything but that we have an unshakable kingdom and he says, at the end of that, he says, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. There's this, there's, this is the picture of zeal, the zeal of God, the zeal of the Lord, right? This verse says, the zeal of the Lord, will, of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Sometimes, I said before, sometimes it's directed against Israel. If, they, if they're uh, breaking commandments, don't listen to the prophets. But it also operates on behalf of Israel when enemies are threatening to destroy it. And also in, in the Old Testament, humans, every now and then, are mentioned to be filled with the zeal of God, kind of like representatively. And it always involves, here's the thing, that it always involves quick action on their part. Like there's a story of, of Phineas and, and how the Israelites had been in this sin and they'd been, you know, just going with, with women from Midian. And when they all started to repent, there was this one fellow who was still doing it. Like, even though the rest of the nation was repenting, 
This one guy was like, eh, and he kept going. And Phineas, the son of Aaron, he was just, he just suddenly incensed, and he went and, went and killed the guy. And, and God said that because of that, his anger departed, like, like Phineas was representing God in this zeal. But in all these cases, this zealousness is characterized by direct action on, the, on behalf of God, and it's not, like I said earlier, it's not a mere mood. It's not a passing mood. It's part of God's essence. And here's the thing, it always leads to action. It's not just a feeling. It leads to action on God's part when, he, when his zeal is involved. And, and in Isaiah, there was that action the son, the child that would be given, and the son that would be born. And that's the action that his zeal is propelling him to. His passion and his, ang and his, and his um, not anger, ardor, that's the word I was looking for. His passion and fervor and ardor for us, for his people, for his creation, propels him to do these things. We talked last week about just this crazy thing. That he would be born as a man. What propelled him to do that? His love for us. His zeal for us. In the Old Testament, this is described in lots of places. Uh, Isaiah 49. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. And here's God's reply to that. Can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb. Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me, he says to, to Israel. He says to Zion. They're saying, you forgot us. And he says, I would never forget you. Even if a, even if a mother forgot her son, I still wouldn't forget you. Your name is engraved on the palm of my hand. I open my hand and I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Ezekiel 33, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O Israel? You know, I talked earlier about sometimes his zeal is, is, is breaking out against them for breaking commandments. Sometimes it can be a negative thing for them. But that's not what he wants. He says, I don't take pleasure in that. That's not what I want. What I want you is just to repent. Why should you? Why should this happen to you? If you would just turn, it wouldn't happen. It's part of a larger discussion also in Ezekiel. In Hosea, I won't read it because it's long. If you want to read a great, a great description of, of the zeal of the Lord, Hosea 2, it's a description of, of a woman who's been unfaithful, and that's Israel, right? And the husband is, is God. And he's given everything to her. He's given her food. He's given her clothing. He's given her grain, wine. He says all these things. And she used them to go out and to commit adulterous acts. The stuff he gave her. And he's, he's, at first he starts saying, that's it. I'm done with her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just you know, expose her. Um, she's going to go out into the desert. And he's just speaking all this metaphorical language. He's just, I'm done with her. And then, and then in the middle of all that, just suddenly, he says, therefore... I will allure her. I'll draw her back. He says, I'll bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her there. And I'll betroth her to me again. He, he says, I, I can't stay mad forever. Even in her unfaithfulness, even in all the things she did, he's, he says, I'll... I'll bring her back. I'm going to woo her back. This is, this is the zeal of the Lord, the ardor, the passion. And here's the thing. Jesus, as the exact representation of God, also displayed God's zeal. 
maybe the one of the most obvious ones is is when he's in in John 2 when he's upending the the temple tables where they had turned the court kind of into a money changing place and he was saying this isn't right and he and and the disciples it says later they remembered that it, in the verse in the old testament it says about the messiah zeal for your house will consume him but but he was zealous for for reaching people that were lost he was zealous for healing people read in matthew all the times look do it just go through all of matthew and look through all the times that he says he healed them all sick demon possessed you know anything he, he, he healed there's a crowd jesus comes he healed them all there there's another crowd somewhere else a couple of couple chapters later he healed them all he's 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 showing the same zeal and fervor for us for the image bearers that god is described in the old testament because he's the he's the exact representation of god So the question is, did God's zeal stop at the birth of Jesus? The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this, we read. In Isaiah 9, this child being born, did his zeal stop there? Did it stop at his death and resurrection? Did it stop at the day of Pentecost? Did it stop with the first century church? Or is it continuing today? Is that same zeal displayed towards us today? Romans eight thirty one and thirty two. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us? All things. I know you guys are a reserved group, but that's a pretty good word right there. He who did not spare his own son, how will he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? Say all things. Are there any things that he's not going to give us? No, because if all is one group, then the things that he's not going to give us must be zero. So, okay, God has zeal, he has passion, he has ardor for us, he's fervently, he's, he, he, you know, that's, that's what that song Reckless Love is trying to describe, not that he's reckless towards other people or other things, but he has no regard for his own safety, for his own comfort, he doesn't mind being humiliated, quote unquote. Like there's so many times that, that I think I'm, I'm embarrassing God. But here's the thing. He's not ashamed to be my God. He's not ashamed to be associated with me. Or any of you. No matter what you've done or about to do or are doing right now. So... How does this find expression today, this zeal of God? How does it find expression in your your day-to-day -day things? Is is God stoic or distant? Is he uninvolved, unconcerned with the small details, the day-to-day -day emotions of your small, unnoticeable life? Is that what's going on? And, and we can we would all say, oh yeah, no, he's you know, but but I want to ask you just just to meditate on on how on how that how you, how that bears out in your actions, because I, I find for me that a lot of times I, I I believe it, but I don't always act it out, or I believe it, but sometimes I catch myself not believing it, saying something or doing something that kind of shows that maybe it hasn't sunk in all the way. And, and out there, 
That's a big deal. It's easy to accept a God that is impersonal, is not involved in day-to-day -day life. He created the world. He kind of set the, set the clock. He wound it up and let it go, and now he's, he's hands off. But is he? His, his zeal is compelling him all the time. And it's not just a passing mood, it's who he is. It always results in action. And he intervenes in history, and he intervenes in your life. And how does that bear out in my reliance on God? Do I think of him as just somebody who's up there and unconcerned? Or do I think, man, if it matters to me, it matters to him. Like if it's, it could be a little nothing. It could, it could, it could maybe not even be high on my list of what it, of things that matter to me. But if it's on that list at all, it matters a lot more to him. Do you see God as wise yet removed, or running the cosmos yet restrained from actual involvement in your life? Here's another one. How does it affect your prayers? Do you pray like you're trying to convince an unwilling God to act? Maybe he's not unwilling. Maybe he's just delayed. He doesn't want to do it now. He wants to do it, sure. But he doesn't want to do it now. You've got to convince him to do it now. Or are you praying to a, a passionate, zealous God who wants this more than you do, actually? Like I have family members that need, need to meet Jesus. And when I pray about him, I think, man, Jesus wants that more than I want it. Like I don't have to convince him, twist his arm, bribe him, make promises. Lord, if you'll do this, then I will do that for you. Like that's not the kind of God he is, for one. And for two, he, he's, he's saying, I, I actually am I'm, I'm working on that one already. Like, before you ever thought to pray about it, I was working on it. I want it more than you do. Think, think about this. Uh, you know, there's, there's some stuff in our world that, that no matter whether you're a Christian or not, we would all agree is bad and shouldn't be in our world. Like, uh, like murder, violence, domestic violence. Right? And, and, and some of people, some of the people maybe are, are you know, less... They, they would say, yes, this is not the bad stuff, but, you know, there's, there's whatever, white supremacists out there, for example, that, that do condone certain kinds of violence. So, so some things only Christians would say that's bad, but there's, there's some other things that, that everyone would say, yeah, we, we don't want murder. We don't want hate crimes, right? We don't want people to be killed or or beaten up, lynched, just because of who they are. All this stuff is, it's, it's a plague on our society, and we don't want it. But, but here's the thing. God is so committed to getting rid of that stuff that he actually wants to get rid of, of anger and resentment and bitterness. Right? He said in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount that if you even do that, you've you've killed he that's how committed he is because because that the anger and the bitterness and the resentment is the other stuff just in seed form right we would all agree that sex trafficking is a is a, a terrible blight on our on our world that pornography is is something that, that just has to go and maybe not everybody would agree on this but Christians certainly would adultery, right? And when I say everyone, the other everyone I was talking about at the beginning is the whole world. We would all, go, yeah, it's got, you, know, you can't do sex trafficking. This has got to go. But but Jesus is so committed to to getting rid of that that he actually just wants to get rid of 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 lust and lewdness and licentiousness. I don't know why those all those words start with L, but they do. That's how committed he is. Because, because that, the lust, the, that's just the other thing in seed form. 
it's, it's, that's where it's headed. And he wants to get rid of the root, the whole thing. And, you know, I know, I know passion and can wear different faces, right? It does, it, the, the passion that we're talking about here is a passion that comes out in actions, not necessarily in, you know, emotional outbursts, right? Both for God and, and for us. I know people that, that faithfully, passionately have prayed for the overturning of Roe v. Wade for years and decades. And you wouldn't, you know, they don't talk about it all the time. You wouldn't necessarily know that unless you got to know them. But the fact that they've done that for years, they're passionate about it. So, the zeal of the Lord, is it still around? And is he still displaying it towards us? And then how does that affect you and me in our daily lives? So here, here's my challenge for today. And for this, this time of year, but especially tonight, tomorrow. It involves remembering and reflecting and resolving. So tonight and tomorrow as we remember the event that was the beginning of the greatest display of God's zeal in human history. The birth of Jesus is just the beginning of the greatest display of God's zeal for us. His passion to redeem us and win us back. And as we remember that tonight, I ask that you would reflect on how his zeal has displayed in your personal history. Bring it home. What has he done that displayed just zeal and passion to provide for you, to reach you, to redeem you, to raise you up. So as we remember how it happened in history, reflect on how it happened in your history, and then resolve to be a conduit for the zeal of God to be manifest in the lives and the circumstances of the people around you. Because that's the deal. We're, we're now the salt and the light, the representatives. And he's in us for that purpose. The biggest reason he's in me, yeah, he's transforming me, but he's in me for you. And he's in you for me and, and for those people out there. That's why it's got to come out. So as we remember what it was, that he did reflect also on what he did in your history and resolve to be a conduit of the zeal and passion of God to those around you. Is that a deal?